remaining folks are getting settled, hello, my name is Jacob Mushlin. Um, I found out about 20 minutes ago that these are supposed to be 20 minutes long instead of 35 minutes long. So there's a big clock right there, but feel free to cough if we're getting to be a little bit longer than we ought to. Um, I've kind of a two, nice, thanks Dad. Um, I kind of have a, a two-pronged practicum because I accidentally started a school while I was building a timber frame. Uh, but before we get too much further into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about me and where I came from and the goals for the project. So um, when I was finishing high school and starting college, I got into carpentry a little bit. So I came to Yes Tomorrow and did the whole project or the uh, practicum with a little bit of experience. Um, I worked for a guy that restored boats and worked in a big crazy shop, which was a lot of fun. Uh, the first real job I had with woodworking where I was a manager was with Youth Build. And I think we got some Youth Build representation tonight, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, my job was to make new household goods out of scrap and salvage material. And I would have two or three Youth Build students uh, every day doing that. Um, this is important because we're going to bring up Youth Build and Rebuild and Resource and Recycle North a little bit later. But just so you know now, it's all the same organization. Waste Not Products, Youth Build, Rebuild, all that jazz is the same. But had a lot of fun with that job. So, yes, tomorrow. Uh, I took my first class many years ago. Uh, it was Treehouse Building, Sustainable Treehouse Design Build with Eric and uh, Eric. And that totally bumped my life trajectory. Eric Stopper was, and still is, really freaking amazing to me. Um, and not soon after that class, I took the core, which also uncorked a lot of fun stuff. Um, and then I took timber framing with Skip and Josh, uh, which was great. Uh, I took the timber framing after the core, and I knew that I really liked timber framing um, because I found myself trying to get involved with as much timber framing as I could outside of educational situations. So I tried to come up with some goals for myself for this project, knowing that I really wanted to do something involved the timber frame. I wanted to gain hand skills or like hard skills, like real experience cutting timbers and pouring concrete, like real physical stuff like that. And I also, frankly, need to gain some more professional skills, maybe organization, uh, maybe professionalism. Um, <laughs> and just to expand my scope of practice is the way I hear a lot of people talk about it. Like if you're a carpenter, or a carpenter's assistant, you can find work, but if you're able to like pull a permit, if you're able to make sure that what you're building is more or less up to code before you go to the building inspector, you can kind of get some more ground, make Boku dollars, and just be hopefully better at what you're doing. And I want to come out of the project better builder, designer, teacher, and human. Uh, my goal for the project was to find an organization that needs a building. I'm not trying to say what other people have done for their core, uh, for their practicum project is not like a meaningful, great project, but some of them seem like they needed to build a building and then they built one, and I wanted to have a need which needed to be filled. Uh, so to go my, the other direction, um, I wanted to do it cheaply and I didn't want to depend on other people's grants. I didn't want to have like the bottom fall out halfway through this whole thing. Um, I can't build a building alone for free, so I wanted to involve as many community members as I could and that also is a little selfish too, because if I can stitch myself into the community more when there's paid work, that will hopefully come back to me, right? I can harvest from that. And along the lines of doing this cheaply, I wanted to solicit donations at every turn. So I thought I knew what I wanted to do. So I started moving forward with that. Burlington is an international refugee resettlement community, which means when the UN or whomever has a whole deck of refugees, Burlington's at the table playing cards. Uh, one of the many programs in town is the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, which is a bit of a misnomer because they work with a lot of Burmese and other folks who aren't from Africa. But the project that got me interested in them is New Farms for New Americans, which is more or less what it sounds like. Uh, for folks who don't have the language or job skills to slip into Burlington's greater community, uh, this program is around so they can at least get like some farming skills that they could turn into a job. There's a uh, part of the education of how to run a small business. And there have been, I think, three little businesses born out of new farms. And when I first got in touch with them, they were going from three acres to six acres. And at the time, they were rinsing their veggies in two big, like, buckets and then letting their veggies dry next to a parking lot, which is not really good for business. And um, for a program that was growing, it wasn't going to be able to, to be what they do. Uh, so. We talked about building a rinse station, which is exactly what it sounds like. You pull vegetables off of your fields, 
you have maybe one, two, or preferably three bins in which to rinse them successively cleaner. And then there's even like a little drying rack and some simple storage on site. Simple concept, almost sculpture, but it has plumbing, so nothing to go too crazy over. Um, now, the associate, uh, New Farms doesn't own the land they're on. It belongs to the <coughs> Renewski Valley Parks District, which is uh, part of the Ethan Allen Homestead, which meant that we had the client, but we also had the host. And with that host came a board of representatives, or a board of trustees, one of which was a huge pain in the ass. Um, the New Farms folks had the leader of the program and two consultants, and I found myself needing to streamline communication a whole lot, because we had six opinions to solicit, and I'd send out an email and I wouldn't hear from anyone, because no one likes work emails. Like, you've never been like, oh, great, Gary asked me about productivity. No offense, Matt, sorry. That's like the worst thing I could have said. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I was in a situation where I was like, well, do I wait till I get all of the opinions and then we try to talk about it? Do I try to meet with them? And that wasn't working. So I tried to have some fun with it. You guys remember Battleships? F5, you sunk my clipper. Uh, so I'd like make a document like this and send it out. And six hours later, I'd have responses and everyone knew what we were talking about. Prior to that, it was a lot of like, I think we want to be southwest of the northernmost tree line, which wasn't helpful at all. So. From that uh, image, I sent this document out where people could draw right on it. They could really engage with it. Um, and after these two, we knew where it was going. We knew how big it was going to be. And we were ready to kind of move forward, which was great. It was at this point that my patient and lovely uh, <laughs> advisor for the project, Skip, was, was real then, um, and helped me design this little structure. Um, the biggest impression I have after the whole thing was I should have involved Skip a little bit more. I wanted to learn as much as I could on my own. I wanted to have him as like guidance, but I wanted to potentially make mistakes that weren't catastrophic and then own them. Um, there weren't too many mistakes, thank goodness, but simple structure, 12 feet wide at the gable end, six, just about 16 feet long, uh, <clears throat> three foot overhang on all sides, so the gable, the rafter plates come out three feet over here, three feet back there. The rafter, I guess what would be fascia is three feet out. Um, pretty simple. There are three bents. Um, there's a 10 foot distance here and a 6 foot here. And the original plan was to have lockable storage in that little 6 foot zone. That ended up not being the case because things changed. But anyway, at this point I had a client, I had a location, I had a cut list. So it was time to get a permit, which I was excited to do. Um, it seems like in the world of building there's a plexiglass ceiling between the folks who are just on the ground building and the folks that like go and pull the permit and can produce the drawings. Um, so through the Yesterverse, I heard about Richard Siplinski, who's a doll. He not only fell the timbers, cut them, but delivered them for free, which is insane. Um, he cut all of the vertical posts. There were nine of them, all of the tie beams. There were three and all of the braces, which there are a bunch of pairs of those. Um, charming young man. Um, <laughs> And the rest of the material came from Dave's sawmill, which was a recommendation from Skip. Uh, I went out and actually got material from Dave a couple times. It was an interesting time. Uh, the first time I picked up material was before Irene. The second time was after. And Irene, like, stole all of his wood, which is kind of crazy. And I think 48 hours after the storm, he was up and running again, after, like, presumably pumping his <coughs> sawmill dry. So... At this point, I'm going to mess with time a little bit just to separate things. All of the cutting you're going to see in a minute was cut at the same time of all these floor joists, but we're just going to focus on the site and then go to the cutting and move on, just in case you had a question about that. So, eh? Yeah. Um, Vermont State Archaeologist Scott Dillon. Um, the Ethan Allen Homestead is a historically significant location in Burlington, which means to do any work, we need to have a state archaeologist check it out. You can not penetrate the plow line, which is, if you imagine the, the whole ground covered in tin foil, you can't pierce more than eight inches below it, which is not going to be satisfactory for a foundation. Um, there's two state archaeologists in Vermont that check out sites like this, and they're both really freaking busy. So I left a couple messages with Scott. I started to pull my hair out a little bit. I told him more about the project when I finally got him on the phone, and he mentioned how much he likes working with organizations, how much he likes teaching what he does. And at that point, I made it happen that Ripple Youth Group would be around to help with the site work. 
Uh, so there's a church group that's interested in global peace. More or less, it seems like it's keeping teenagers out of trouble on Saturday, too. Um, and Scott came out and dug his square holes. And the youth uh, had a lot of fun shaking all of the gravel out. Fortunately, we didn't find anything, so we were able to build the building. But it seemed like a really great opportunity for Scott to feel like he was doing his job better than normal and uh, to involve some other people. It was like a key to success. Um, Oscar the excavation dog. Uh, once we had the green light to dig holes, um, I got in touch with transitional services for youth and families, which is super vague sounding. Um, I don't really know what they do, but I had a couple sixth graders and a couple eighth graders come out who are really excited to dig holes and mix concrete. And uh, the, the only time, unfortunately, that the new farms participants were really able to be a part of the building phase uh, was at this stage, mostly because their season was up and running the whole time we were cutting, and frankly, I think they really wanted their weekends, which was when we did most of the cutting, but got the foundation poured. Um, yes, tomorrow semester program, the inaugural class, after we smashed the champagne bottle on the whole thing, got to come out uh, and assisted with my very poorly designed uh, method of laying floor joists. We don't need to get too far into it, but this could have been like an hour instead of needing 20 people. Uh, anyway, they had a blast. You can see Carrie tied herself up, tied herself up over it. Annie and I were interns here at Yesterday at the same time, so she had a gas out here. Um, and that's that's where we ended. So we've got that much all set. Now we get into the cutting phase, which brings us back to that first wood shop I worked in. Waste not products, rebuild, all that jazz. I knew I needed a place where I could store timbers, I knew I needed a place where I could lock tools, and I knew I needed a place that wouldn't care if the project dragged on for a really long time. Enter Waste Not Products. Uh, when I ran the wood shop, there was a really nice young man named Jeremy who was often leaving messes around and was really excited about doing his own projects, and he was kind of the bane of my existence. And now he runs the shop. And he was kind enough to let me uh, do all of our cutting in there. It worked out very, very well. So. Uh, we're, so, yep, sorry. Another fun fact about Rebuild, uh, there's a six-person deconstruction crew going around town, taking buildings down, denailing two-by-fours and selling them at pennies on the dollar from what you'd spend at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, everything is tax-free because it's already been paid for once. And uh, has anyone in here heard of Dan Phillips? He was in the New York Times because he was building buildings out of scrap and salvage stuff. Place is right up his alley. Um, if you're ever in Burlington, 339 Pine Street. And the woodshop will come sort of back into conversation momentarily. So this was a little Plinko moment in life. When the Plinko thing is falling and it hits a nail and it could go one way or it could go the other way and it'll change everything, but you don't know. Um, I knew I was going to be involving a lot of the community. I wanted to cut the frame with as much community help as I could. I knew I'd be advertising it. And I thought, if I'm building this much momentum, why have it be just about a project? Why not make it something more like Batman? You can kill the man, but you can't kill an idea. Right? So for the first time, I just decided to make up Measure Twice Community School and add it to the bottom of the poster, knowing that if I wanted to, I could potentially work in that woodshop again, and we could keep whatever this is becoming alive longer. That's really the only thinking I'd done. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Itamar Silver truck Canadians down for each one of the weekends. Um, this is the first day of cutting. A couple folks that have since been to Yes Mara, I know Nick and Greg, uh, those two groovy guys just raised their frame last weekend, which is tremendous. Nate Simpson and Itamar were both at Josh's raising, and I think both cut that frame. There's Oscar the beer drinking dog. And this is my favorite part of the presentation, because this is how I spent all last summer, um, which was a lot of fun. Melina Marvin, former intern, Annie, my lovely wife, Liz Gennard, working at it. Um, and it was great, you know. Yeah, it was a uh, And throughout this... While we were working in there, there were many times where we'd need to move a bunch of material one way or the other, and it would be like 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, and we wouldn't want to do it, so Monday morning, youth build would be like, yeah, man, let's move all that shit for you. They're great. <laughs> Tremendous partners for the project. Over the course of, of cutting the frame, a couple organizations were interested in sniffing it out. They just heard about it through the grapevine, I guess, but um, an instructor at Green Mountain College got in touch with me, and his class toured the studio or the shop and I talked about how timber framing works. They got to ride the boring machine. Um, two UVM sculpture classes came through and I, at least one core class walked through as well. Coincidentally, they were in town. They didn't make the trip special, but 
I was tantalized by that. I thought it was great. So there are two rafter plates on the structure that are 22 feet long. Um, you can totally get a 22 foot long timber, but I can't move one around with the Honda Element. Um, next to that, I really wanted to cut a scarf joint. A scarf joint, unlike a mortise and tenon, which might be perpendicular, or like a rafter, which would be in an angle, a scarf joint is in line. It's taking two shorter timbers and making one longer one, like a Roman handshake. So just for the hey, why not, we put two of them in the structure. Um, most of what I had to go off of was a drawing that Josh had from the frame I cut in that class in May of 2010, I think. And I happened to be sort of crowning this whole thing while Skip was teaching a class, so he, he walked me through the layout. Um, so just because it was the coolest part of the cutting, uh, we laid the thing out. All we had was a standard size circular saw, so we did two rip cuts on either side. It's an eight inch timber and that cuts around three inches, so there was two inches of flesh still. So we needed to find a way to get around that. I think Itamar recommended that we kerf it, we sever the fibers, and there's Annie Harris, another core participant. Um, and then I had at it with an ax and cut up my bald head. <laughs> and then Itamar did this sort of faux hand hewing to rough it out. And it was big enough that we could have two people parring it at the same time, which is kind of crazy. Um, and that's the table, the big flat expanse. That big flat part is three feet long. And there it is sort of finished up. Um, as I said, that was a little unnecessary, but a whole lot of fun. <laughs> so my favorite part of the whole thing, um, almost a year ago today, which is embarrassing and really, you know, makes, gets a warm feeling in my stomach. We raised it. <laughs> Um, for the first time, Measure Twice starts to look like a thing. Uh, the posters haven't changed in their layout since then. Uh, I made a series of five different tools. I put them out like four or five weeks in advance uh, because I knew we'd need a lot of bodies to raise this thing. I'd never done that before, so the more people we have, the better. Um, by law, I have to have the building permit visible, so there it was. Uh, there's the family work vehicle that did a lot of schlepping. The first time all the timbers were, at, were sort of together was on the morning of the raising, uh, which would have been terrifying if Skip hadn't come out the night before and assembled the three bents with me. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that raising day would have been a negative experience for me if Skip hadn't come out and did all that work in exchange for like a mediocre pizza. Um, <laughs> morning of the raising, there were a bunch of people there. Some of the new farms participants were on site, which was great. There was a uh, translator named Rita with whom I got very close by the end of the day. Um, and yeah, man, it was like, we swept frost off the deck. By the time we had the second bent up, there were a good number of people there. The sun came out. A bunch of really close friends there in a photo coming up showed up, which was delightful. Um, there were some corrections to make on the site, not surprisingly. Um, and it was just a great freaking day in Burlington. There were, I would guess that over the course of the day, somewhere between 50 and 70 people came and went. They were never all there at the same time, but faces changed. That's just trying to get one of the uh, big scarf joints up. Um, this guy, Brian, I don't know if he even took classes here, but I met him through Yes Tomorrow. He was kind enough to help us figure out how to properly fit together a uh, scarf joint. Look at that handsome guy with the mustache. Um, and that's where we left it at the end of the day. Uh, you'll notice there are zero rafters on that because two were cut and they were both cut incorrectly. Um, I ordered 18 for that very reason, but that's as far as we could go. I stapled some things to the top of the whole ordeal and kind of walked away. There's all those good people. That was a lot of fun. Um, there was a lot of good food there. Uh, August 1st donated like 60 scones. American flatbread donated a bunch of food. Um, uh, pizza, City Market donated some juice. And um, most of the folks in the New Farms program brought some sort of dish, which was incredible. <coughs> I spent the whole day scratching my head and running around, uh, but everyone else ate a lot of really good looking food. Um, so while all of this was going on, I noticed this like young gangly kid running around with a camera the whole time. I had no idea who he was, and except for one embarrassing part at the end of this, I didn't even pay him any attention. Um, and like two weeks later, I get a video sent to me via email, which he, I, I think, did everything, soup to nuts, took the film, matched it to a song you're gonna hear in a minute, um, and I, I'll admit, I, I teared up a little bit the first time I saw it. Uh, it was really touching because not only was it like a, a big day as far as work goes, but a lot of really close friends were there. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to watch it right now. It's like two minutes long. 
If I cringe, it's because I've seen this so many times and have heard my voice so much, it's like hearing your own mom rap. It's like, uh, <laughs> sounds like an ass. <laughs> so, I'm gonna sit. Oh. Your sound? Yeah. posters up thanking the organizations that helped out with it um, because there is sort of a, an exchange there, an expectation. And the little tagline there is, uh, these businesses are supporting your community. Reciprocity is the foundation of a healthy relationship. Um, so as I said, there were no rafters on the whole thing by the time we were done. So uh, Youth Build came in and tied up some loose ends with the flooring, which they had a blast with. I organized a bunch of rafter cutting parties. Uh, some of the folks that helped out there are, are here tonight, which was a uh, thank you very much. Um, now, you, you don't want to try to raise rafters with like one or two volunteers. You want to have a group of people you want to start and you want to finish. Uh, and I was cr lucky enough to get um, the maintenance crew from Winooski Valley Parks District to come out and work with me for, for that morning. And for guys that spent their whole summer mowing lawns and like using a shovel, they seemed pretty psyched on it. It only took us a couple hours. And they were interested in helping out in the future, which I absolutely took advantage of. Um, <laughs> Youth Build came up and applied strapping or purlins, uh, which is the intermediary before the roofing goes on. Another great opportunity to have them out there. Andrew Jope, uh, wonderful man. Also my primary contact for the uh, Ripple Youth Group. And as I said, Winooski Valley came out and it, it sort of looked like applying roofing if we were in the Soviet Union. Like it was not safe or it's on there. It looks great. It's secure. It was not safe. Um, so, virtual tour. This is coming around the bend. There's a little frame right there. Uh, this is, you know, the three-quarter view, which you're going to see most of the time. And here's it with a rainbow behind it. There's two. He, you, also, <laughs> you also might notice right here, there's like an added little bit of whatnot. And that's because... When I cut the frame, I put standard tenons on as opposed to through tenons. Just so you know, a through tenon has much more relish. It has much better tying ability. We're talking about, uh, you know, if this is the roof and these are the, the tie beams pushing down, they're fighting that downward splitting force that a roof load would give. 
I don't think they would give out, but Skip mentioned it would be a good idea to build some redundancy there. So, in the words of Melina Marvin, I turned an eyesore into an icon. Uh, I took some 2 by 12s and cut a big swoop on them. Um, and then Amanda and I just uh, screwed in some leftover scraps that really we just need to get rid of. And now that big primary space has this like beautiful false vault over it, which might become animal habitat at some point, hopefully not, but <laughs> I think it looks great. It does a great job. Uh, so enter measure twice. Uh, well, uh, as I said, you know, and, oh Jesus. Um, <laughs> I wanted to make this project more than just a timber framing project that would start and stop. Um, and I decided to partner up with the wood shop. I decided to come up with a simple idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, the idea being that you don't need to be great at things to be able to complete them. That the more you know about how, how you do things, uh, the, uh, the more you'll be interested in doing them better. And that when you know how to do things, you, you have a little bit more self-control in life and you have a little bit more agency. So that was kind of the thought. Hosted a cutting boards class. Uh, Ryan made a crazy cutting board that had a live edge around it. She had a blast. There were a couple other folks. Um, hosted a hand hewing workshop with the help of my friend Carl. Um, that was a lot of fun. We started talking about how to sharpen an axe and what hand hewing was and then we went out and did it. And uh, we're in the middle of the autumn semester. Um, which uh, started with an introduction to woodshop. Uh, we did some sharpening. We scheduled hand hewing. wasn't a good idea. Turns out you don't need to run that like every three months. Um, and that's still going on. On uh, the 7th of November, I'll be doing a free tutorial on SketchUp. On the 10th, there'll be sort of a deeper paid class. And then we're going to teach people how to do sheetrock repairs because if you rent in Burlington and you bump a hole in your wall, that'll cost you 200 bucks through your landlord or it'll cost you maybe $17 to repair yourself. Um, so that closes us out at like 29 minutes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns, queries? That'll work. <laughs> So how was the project funded? Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I wanted to be able to be funded by the folks that would be owning it. Um, I don't have like a stapled down total cost. <laughs> I know that 30 to 40% of the wood was donated outright. And that like in its roughest estimation, like a, and actually Skip, I would love, and Josh, and Matt, everyone that does timber framing in this room, which is a surprisingly high percentage, a 12 foot long eight by eight. Let's just call it $70? Probably a little less, but close. 60 bucks? Yeah. yeah. So extrapolate that out quite a bit. <laughs> um, uh, all of the wood came from within like 50 miles because we used local sources. Um, all the decking and everything else you saw, I got from resource for very, very cheap. Um, the only thing that was purchased brand spanking new besides the wood was the roofing, which we got from Lowe's because we were looking at economics more than the ecological vision. Yes, ma'am. What has your feedback been for the people who are using the station? Uh, besides, dude, put a roof on it. Um, it's been positive. You know, they, they started with nothing. And <coughs> not even the cost of materials, they now have a structure. Um, it's been interesting. The initial contact I have has since moved on. She moved across the country. Uh, the current person that has her position uh, had a baby on like Tuesday. Um, so there's a lot going on. The whole system for washing has changed as well. The earliest drawings just had two sinks, now they want to have three. And frankly, they'd rather have a space that can easily be manipulated than build that lockable storage. So as far as the, the floor plan goes, I don't think it'll change too much. They like the ability to just move a couple um, cinder blocks and move the tubs around. And I need to satisfy the city's need for railing. Uh, but outside of that, and making sure the plumbing gets hooked up, pretty much there. There is one other detail coming out here. Um, the whole time we were cutting, Itamar would truck his illegals into the country. Um, on like a Friday night, we'd cut all day Saturday. And then Sunday morning, we'd make waffles. <coughs> And I would like all of you to go home with that waffle recipe. So you'll be handed a little card that has that waffle recipe in it. <laughs> Just so you know. All right. 
Um, and unless there's any other questions or comments. Um, so what are your plans for the Measure Twice project? Put you out of business? <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm hoping to run those three classes in November and maybe try to squeeze one more in in December. I'd like to not be in Vermont for most of the coldest, slowest work period. Um, this summer I was in touch with a lovely young couple about doing a tiny house class. Unfortunately, they decided to allocate funds somewhere else, which makes a lot of sense. Like, they didn't have a finished bathroom. I don't know why they were thinking about building another little structure on their property. Um, I like that I haven't invested too much more in it besides satisfying my need to make pretty things on Illustrator. So there's, you know, um, I don't own any insurance on it. All of the insurance and the space is owned by resource. They get a cut of tuition. Um, we buy all of our material from them and they get a lot of publicity. So I don't have too much invested in it. I'd like to keep it going as much as I can because I love teaching. Um, currently, the two things I get, the thing I get paid for the most, I also give away for free, um, which I really like. I like that if you're into it, you can come down to the wood shop and do something that would cost you quite a bit and you can do it entirely for free. So, I don't know where it's at. Other than that, we've got 45 minutes left, so thank you very much for your time. <laughs>